Hello, I'm James Batchelor. And I'm Chris Dring. And you are listening to Rare Replayed. Press A. Hooray! It's time for Rare Replayed. Rare Replayed um, is uh, an incredibly original name. Uh, we dreamt up two weeks ago, just ahead of the launch of Rare Replay. Mm -hmm. The idea behind it is to go back in time and play... Well, the idea is to play every single game on the Rare Replay box set. We'll see how well we do. And um, one down, down, twenty nine to go. One down, twenty nine to go. Um, and uh, and we'll probably end up doing the ones that weren't on the rare replay uh, yeah. disc later on. Uh, and talk about our experiences of them, our memories of them, if we have them. And uh, also to bring on some of the creators of those games to discuss the uh, process of working on them. And um, oh, we're we're starting on a really interesting one, aren't we, James? Mm. We're starting with Perfect Dark. Um, I can't remember why, other than that, I think it, it, I think it's one of our favourites on the entire collection. It's certainly my favourite out of the entire collection. We couldn't start with Goldeneye, because it's not on the disc, yes. so we started with Perfect Dark. Um, and I don't know about you, James, um, I got Perfect Goldeneye a year after it came out, so it was quite late, and um, I loved that game, and I had friends come over to my house every single day to play it. That's all they wanted, like PlayStation fans, they told you, they'd lie to you and tell you that their console was the best. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't, but when they came over, they only wanted to play one game. That's the thing, like, they were all like, oh, we've got, we've got Metal Gear Solid, we've got Final Fantasy VII, we've got Grand Theft Auto. Yeah, but you want to play Goldeneye. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> it was the one, I mean, obviously, on, on reflection, perhaps it wasn't the only, N64 wasn't the only great, I mean, in my mind, I would no regret getting that machine at all. No, but, absolutely no. Golden was a game they all wanted to play and um, I actually got a bit fed up at the end of it I was saying come on we play some of this one or that one um, but uh, so when Perfect Dark hit the headlines when that was coming out I couldn't wait to finally have a game to take Golden Eye out of the cartridge yeah same I mean, I, Perfect Dark was um was yeah another another favorite of mine and my friends. I think I don't think we ever went back to Goldeneye after Perfect Dark came out because there were just, there were so many more weapons and arenas. There were so many more things you could do with it. I mean, my earliest memory of um, Perfect Dark. I remember obviously reading all the previews and like N sixty four magazine and stuff. But my my strongest memory was the day that I bought it. I was so excited. I ran out to Special Reserve. Do you remember Special Reserve? I used to. I won games by yeah. Special Reserve. Um, went to Special Reserve. Bought the game. Bought the game with my dad because I was only fifteen, so I couldn't buy it on my own. Bought the game, ran home, not ran home, that was too far. Came home, mum said, oh, what did you buy? Perfect Dark, showed her the box, and she zoomed in straight away on the little 18 certificate. And I had not noticed that. Neither had my dad, for which he got a massive earful later. And mum actually wanted me to take it back. And I'm like, no, 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 mum. It's an 18 because they occasionally say bitch. And there's some very, very unconvincing blood. This is a 64-bit era. I mean, Christ! You can play the blood in um, you you can play the blood in Perfect Dark now, to some of the gorier games that are, are, are now on the market. It's nothing, is it? No, I I remember I had a countdown, countdown to Perfect Dark. I've never been more hyped for a game since. I mm. don't think I was so excited, and I actually remember playing it and being somewhat disappointed. And I think it's because it was all pitched as Golden Eye Two. Yeah. And um, and disappointed is the wrong word. I it wasn't the second coming of Christ that I think I expected it to be. And um, let's just be honest, the, the voice acting which was great, they introduced it, but it was bloody awful. Yes. Um, the storyline was nonsense. I mean, we play, you play it through on Agent, you have no idea what's going on half the time. Suddenly aliens start appearing out of nowhere, you're not entirely sure why. Um, the only thing I actually became obsessed with was the firing range. I was obsessed with the firing range. Even the tricky, uh, uh, what's it, the, 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 the gun where you fired darts at the, I found that almost oh, the, Yeah, the injection gun, yeah. But yeah. Um, and you know, I love the fact that you can wander around the base. I love the multiplayer modes, I love the multiplayer challenges, but I love those far more than I love the single player story. Um, and um, I remember actually after a few months, people wanted to go back to Goldeneye. And it's because they were familiar with it. When I play both of them today, I can't believe I made, I went back to Goldeneye, mm. because Perfect Dark is such a stronger game than it, um, than it was. Um, and uh, and you know I play playing it through it now. It's it's just a it's, it, it it takes you back to a time where you think why do people don't make first person shooters like this anymore? I understand that the new way first person shooters are made probably launched from Halo and then popularised by Call of Duty. Um, they are excellent games, but everyone makes games like it. And you think well you know you can make a game like Perfect Dark where you do have four player multiplayer where you can hold as many guns where health does deplete and you doesn't come back magically. Mm. It's I know that, they, that that's an old-fashioned way of making games, but there are people like us, who are only 30 years old, I am anyway, um, who want to actually experience a game where I can have a couple of mates over for a beer and have some have some old shooter game. The only game now that I can do that with is Mario Kart, 
and the Wii Sports, and it's it's a big shame. That said, that when you do go back to it, like I, I, when I finally got the damn thing working, oh god, you had I, a nightmare, I, didn't you? Yeah, I did. So a rare replay, obviously, like when you stick in the disc, it tries to install all the old Xbox 360 ones, and it insists on you having to download a profile, and it would not let me do it. I think I, I think I, I worked out later that Xbox Live happened to go down at almost the minute that I started to use it. So I don't know if I broke Xbox Live. You I did. Don't, That's I, yeah, basically, yeah. So sorry, Xbox Live owners, I broke it. But it was just this... In I, I was going beyond mental because it was it's not like you. I know, I know, I know. It's very rare for me to have an anger management problem. Um, I was just going beyond mental that it wouldn't let me download my 360 profile, which means I couldn't even play. It wouldn't even let me create a new 360 profile. They need to get that kink ironed out because Rare Replay is going to suffer for that because the best, some of the best games are the ones that you, the, that you download that as, as separate 360 titles rather than the ones on the disc. But when I finally got it um, working, I, I played through like the first few levels. I played it on Secret Agent. Um, because shamefully I never used to I always used to play on Agent and uh, I just it's so difficult I, I actually kept on dying left right and centre I didn't know where I was going um, yeah it was awful I, I, I perfect I, thingies were perfect dark as well we want to this is supposed to be a brief introduction before we bring on our guest yes. um, is that there's just it's just so massive mm. and um, the multiplayer mode is massive and it has its own challenges and its own sub challenges and you've got the current institute which has things where you can do the, the training and then you could do the, the firing range and then there's the main storyline which is the normal length storyline but as you quite pointed out agent to secret agent to perfect agent you know it, it's uh, it is they are so difficult. I mean, they're, they're so different to the games. The games almost, trans- you know, Golden Knight added an extra couple of missions onto each one. Mm. Perfect Dark effectively rewrites the mo- the single player mode every time you. You have to play the di- missions completely different ways. I think like I remember going to the airbase, and if you play it on Agent, you're doing a third, maybe a quarter of the things you have to do on Perfect Agent. Mm. Even the uh, Carrington Villa level, if you play on Perfect Agent, you start in a completely different. Area, you became that negotiator that you were protecting with a sniper yes, rifle, I remember. Um, and you started in a completely different place. It, it was it was such a colossally huge game, and that's without going through all of them as counter op and co op. Oh yeah, and then uh, and then the uh, there was the bonus missions afterwards, so like Mister Blonde's Revenge, and oh. I can't remember the last two because I never unlocked them because I wasn't good enough. It was just <laughs> just filled with things. Not all of it worked. Let's be honest. As I'm gutted counter operative never really took on. No, it became a thing. But when you play that game, it isn't really a mode that works. It's interesting and it's experimental. But and there's lots of that in there, and you can see Rare having an awful lot of fun with it. But we have a we have somebody from who worked on that game, or at least a chunk of it, uh, here with us today. Indeed. So uh, let's introduce him. Um, yeah. And before um, we continue, I just have to warn people that my uh, headphones uh, echo my own voice into it. So if I, my voice goes very strange because I can hear myself and I can't I can't work it out at all. We don't like to listen to you either. No. So how you can stand listening to yourself, we we know. No, I don't know how I'm going to cope with that. It's going to be really weird. Anyway. Aren't you? I recognize you from before. You helped me. Thank you. You you speak our language? Watch her, she's sharp. <sighs> What's wrong? I have a headache. And with a head this big, that's no joke. Can you walk? We must leave before they get organized and hunt us down. I think so. What's your name? I'm Agent Dark, or Joanna, if you'd prefer. Well, Joanna, I'm Protector One, but you can call me Elvis. Okay, we are joined by Carl Hilton, former employee of Rare. Carl, uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, and how you contributed to Perfect Dark. Um, well, I've been at Rare. I came. I did a graphics. Uh, degree at Bournemouth University, uh, computer animation, and I got recruited to Rare straight from there. This was back in the early 90s. Um, turned up at Rare, did a tiny bit of work on Killer Instinct, as it was at the time, which was an arcade machine, and then went on to the GoldenEye team, and obviously got on very well with those guys, and we, we did GoldenEye together, and then after that, 
uh, we decided to make Perfect Dark. Um, Rare were only doing Golden Eyes a one-off deal for Nintendo, so the Bond license was moving on somewhere else, and they asked us to do something um, which maintained the first-person idea, but but took it in a new direction where we could develop our own intellectual property that didn't rely on you know on James Bond. So. Uh, it was very much a team effort of us having delivered GoldenEye, sitting down and looking at GoldenEye and what was good and what was bad, and then and then deciding what interested us um, technically and also what interested us from a story point of view. So where did the idea come from? Because as you say, like the Bond license was going elsewhere. I I kind of heard we uh, we heard recently that actually you guys turned down the Bond license because you didn't want to keep doing Bond games, or is that something that I, I shouldn't know? <laughs> no, no, no. It was always a one-off deal. Uh, that yeah. Was told. Uh, we were always well aware that we would just do GoldenEye and then after that we would have some freedom. I think, you know, we wanted some freedom to do something of our own creation anyway. Not that, obviously, with, with hindsight and seeing how well GoldenEye did, but doing another Bond game wasn't tempting, but we were quite happy to, to go off and do something else again because, obviously, it, we had more freedom. So where did the idea come from for Perfect Dark? So it, it, if you go from GoldenEye to Perfect Dark, there's a lot of... A lot of differences, like even you could have just done another uh, spy game, modern day spy game, but you've got the whole sci-fi a- angle of it. You've got the whole alien side by the end of the game. Um, it's just it's. I remember reading about it like when it first when it was first previewed. And it's always like, oh, a spiritual successor to Gold Goldeneye, but playing it last night, it's it's kind of nothing like it <laughs> and everything like it at the same time. So yeah, what was the process behind coming up with the idea for it? Um, I think there was a lot of interest on the team in general to do science fiction we most of us were science fiction fans to some degree or other and so the opportunity to do a science fiction game was was very strong early 90s i mean i know i was very into the x files at the time so and quite a few other team members were so again the sort of conspiracy theories you know alien invasions that were being hushed up and, and that whole sort of big government thing was was very big on tv at the time and i think we were keen to to do our own take on that and it was generate an interesting story um and so from that point of view, I think we wanted to do something that was, was sci-fi, but also had the, the, the big government conspiracy thing in it. And, and that was and that kind of tied in with a bit with James Bond, because you always had the big, you know, criminal villain who was doing something bad for the world. So we, we were sort of going off from that. There's a world threat here, but this time the world threat is, is not a, a James Bond villain. It's something else. How um, similar? Because obviously you didn't work on all of Perfect Dialogue, because you left off. Um, a period of time, didn't you? How different was the game that you were working on from the one that actually came out? Pretty similar, actually. I mean, we we were on the game for quite a long time. We certainly planned everything out. Um, I finished all of my artwork. I mean, I was doing all the, a lot of the background artwork. Not all of it. Some of the other artists came on board. But I certainly planned out all the backgrounds, and we certainly uh, blocked them all out. And I texted up all the different elements of the backgrounds that I was working on. So... The final there was bits and pieces to be done, and, and there were a few tweaks to the gameplay. But fundamentally, you know, the last year of a game, which was effectively when most of the team had left to do Free Radical, was about you know fine tuning the gameplay and you know testing and fixing and, and fine tuning it some more. So some nice things got went in afterwards that, that we hadn't thought about. But fundamentally, you know, we were pretty pleased with what we saw when it came out. It was it was what we sort of were expecting. So what were the uh, what were the big surprises for you when you finally played the game? It's like, oh, that's new. Uh, there were mainly in the artwork, from my point of view. There were bits for the um, the day to dine center where it's like, oh, I didn't build that, and I didn't know they were going to build that. So they, they'd obviously come up with some extra t- missions and tasks they wanted, and they had to build some extra areas for it. So you know, it was just additional additional areas which were quite fun to dis- discover something you didn't when you left it it wasn't there and then when you came back to it it's like oh <laughs> what's, what's so. the cheese in the game when you <laughs> making it sorry the cheese the, you could find hidden lumps of cheese in every level yeah Let I, me... I honestly don't remember whether that was us or them after we left <laughs> sounds like a very thing. free radical like, thing I, I, I wouldn't want to take credit for that no <laughs> I still haven't found all the cheese. That's the annoying thing. Like, I've played the game to death, and I still have not found all the cheese. James and I were uh, how old were we? Uh, fifteen or whatever. Yeah, I was fifteen. But we were so excited. I, mean, I don't think I've ever been more hyped up about a game since before since. Um, did you feel that pressure? I mean, Goldeneye was the reason people bought the N64 in the UK. Um, yeah, I mean. I wouldn't say it was pressure. Uh, we were certainly very excited. Um, we were 
I think because we didn't know what to expect with Goldeneye and we were all very naive, we'd all just made our first game having come out of the university, so we assumed this is the way video games work, so like, okay, we'll do this again. Um, and this time we've learned a bit more and we know what, we won't make some of the mistakes. I mean, you know, a lot of early time on Goldeneye was just finding our feet and, and working out what things did and didn't work, so Perfect Dark, we could hit the ground running, so to speak, and I certainly had lots of ideas for environments and also just ways to do things so that the performance was better we worked closely as a team, um, so we had a good working ethic through the whole team. So, you know, a lot of excitement. Um, and the assumption was that, oh, yeah, you know, well, we've done GoldenEye, so we can do Perfect Dark, and, and this one will be a lot better than GoldenEye, because GoldenEye, from our point of view, was very frustrating, because there were lots and lots of things in there that we weren't happy with. Um, so it was like this was our chance to fix everything. <laughs> uh, frame rate, for start. I mean, we, we were building things without really thinking about how to keep the game running fast and then we spent a lot of our time trying to fix it later so um, trying to just make sure that we built things in the way so that we weren't wasting time and we weren't wasting frame rate so the, all the golden eye you know if you set off a load of explosions the whole thing could pretty much come to a halt <laughs> yeah I remember doing that like in, in the multiplayer if you play like remote mines it's you fine. just bring the game to a halt whereas if on perfect dark I, I seem to remember it, did, it didn't do that like it would the, the explosions would be delayed. Like there was there was that older exploit where one of the sims or one of the bots couldn't detonate remote mines. So if you set yourself against all of them, they throw remote mines around and they can't detonate them. So you just chuck one in, blow it up. And then it can be blowing up for about 10, 20 minutes, I think I managed to rack up. But it doesn't slow for a moment. So yeah, at least you, you definitely accomplished that. I mean, have, have you... That immersion gameplay. Yeah. Yeah, have you played um, Perfect Dark yourself recently? Obviously, it's just come out in a rare replay. That's uh, kind of why we're doing the show, but no, I, I need to get my hands on Rare Replay. I haven't. Uh, I, I did actually see it at a at a show I was at not long ago, and there was a group of four people playing Deathmatch on it, which was great to see because I hadn't seen it for a while. Um, although it's always slightly shocking to see games that are that old that you <laughs> <laughs> that in your head were much better than you know they now look. But uh, yeah, I really miss a proper four player yeah. multiplayer, sitting around the TV and punching your friends and looking at their screen. I miss that. I, I miss, um, and I, I started, so I was playing last night, I played, I started on the, the combat simulator challenges that slowly unlocked all the levels. I miss levels that I can actually find my way around. Call of Duty, not a fucking clue. You drop me straight back into Perfect Darks, it's not Temple. What's the first one? The, um, the weird Skedar Ruin one. Oh, yes, oh. yep. Yeah, you drop me in that level, I know exactly where I'm going, even now, even like fucking ten years on. Um, I just I miss deathmatch arenas where you, you knew where you were going. Well, we were very limited by poly count and texture budget uh, and the size of the cartridge as well because it was cartridge based. So we were very limited on memory overall. So we had to be keep the levels at a reasonable size because otherwise, one, we couldn't have fit them on the cartridge and, and two, they didn't work very well as levels for us because of the amount of textures they required. So they start to be very repetitive and you would get lost in them. So, uh, you know, the natural limitations of the technology back then helped to make meant the levels were smaller, but it, it forced you to be think more about the, the design, I think. Mm. You had three different designs in that game. You had the Skedar and the... The, the, the Greys. The, uh, the Mayans. The Mayans the little, yeah. and, then, and then obviously the humans and Data Dine and Carrington in, in, in suit. You had all these different elements, and obviously the we they all had their own weapons and things like that. How much of a challenge was that for you? Uh, well, I mean, it was it was great fun. I, I mean, Dave Doak did a lot of the writing, uh, mm -hmm. so he put together a lot of the basics behind uh, sort of the different what was going to happen in the different factions and, and that. Um, we had some good artists, uh, a guy like called Lee Ray, who who was very good with the weapons, and he went through and designed all the weapons. Um, I came from the architecture background, so I had a big list of sort of environments in my head based on buildings I liked and films I liked that I wanted to get in there. So it was kind of came together, mishmash sort of. Well, I want to I want to set something here, so they would work out how the plot would take us to that particular location. Area Fifty One being one, obviously, you know, oh, I want to do Area Fifty One, right? Well, we'll we'll get something set up over there. <clears throat> so it was again the sci-fi element that we could we could be a bit silly and 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 people would accept it, and that's that's always the fun thing about sci-fi, isn't it? I do love that um, even though you weren't licensed on a film this time because obviously GoldenEye was a direct film license there's still some definite film ins um, inspiration that like you know the, the, the opening cut scene flying into Data Nine is obviously very kind of Blade Runner-esque city 
But even even watching it now, now when I watch the Harrison Ford, Gary Oldman Air Force One film, <laughs> I still feel like I know my way around that plane because the way you laid it out was very, very similar to... I, I, I don't know if you I, I, how much you contributed to that, but is there like a strict... like? Air Force One template that everyone has to use, or did you? Are you just fans of that film, or am I reading too much into it because I like that film too much? <laughs> uh, there, I, I didn't actually make that level, but uh, it was it was on my list of things I thought we should do um, because it, it again it was a, it was a more constricted environment, and I liked the idea behind that, um, partly from a performance point of view and, and the repetition of textures, so we could get the textures bigger and sharper and keep the frame rate up, and it seemed you know, and then we'd seen obviously Air Force One as as a, you know, you should have a gun battle on a on a plane. Why not? So, in that sense, it, it it ticked all the boxes for what we were trying to do. And the same with yeah, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a huge Blade Runner fan, and I always wanted to get Blade Runner, and, and you couldn't possibly do that in Goldeneye. So, first opportunity I got, it was like right, we're doing a, a Blade Runner scene. <laughs> so that's why that was that was like that in there. So yeah, I mean, film was obviously a big influence on us. It was a big influence. We watched. It's it's well documented that we'd watched a lot of John Woo movies before we made Goldeneye, and and you know we carried on as a group. Uh, one of the guys, Lee Ray, he had a he bought up one of the big projection systems when they were quite rare and expensive, and we went round to his house in the evenings for movie evenings and watched stuff that we thought would be, you know, that we want to get into the game. Nice. Any particular films? Any anything that we Perfect Dark fans should add to their watch list? <laughs> um, other than Blade Runner, um, I'm trying to think back now. It was mainly Blade Runner. Um, Possibly, and a lot of X Files. I was watching a lot of X Files at the time, so any of the things that went on there. I also, was, I, I played a lot of um, uh, the full Metal Gear Solid, the first one of those on PlayStation One, mm. and I really liked that, and I really liked the environment. So I was very keen. So things like Area Fifty One were very much sort of all. Oh, I want to try and do what they're doing on on Metal Gear Solid. So Perfect Dark also let you uh, rare do the bring its humour to the um, to the game perhaps Goldeneye didn't, didn't allow for it quite as much um, and I really liked uh, what's it you shot one of the guys in the head through a window and his mate runs over bends down and goes he was my best friend um, <laughs> it, it was very funny in places also then quite serious in others um, do you have any I mean obviously you did the art side of it but was that something that was important when developing the game oh yeah um, I mean the, it, was, it was such a great team I mean, we had such good. We understood each other so well at that point. We spent three years, you know, on the first game, and and so you know we understood each other's sense of humour very well, and we we understood each other's work ethic very well. And so it was it was a really good place where you could bounce ideas off each other, and no one was precious. So you know, as an artist, I was quite happy to listen to the programmers and and the designers, you know, Dave and Martin and Mark and those guys, telling me what they liked in the art, and that was fine. And the same way with the art and design, you know, was, everyone contributed. So. Things like the, the comments, the, the script. I mean, Dave wrote a lot of the script, but a lot of it was based on the banter that went on between us. And, and things would be, you know, and we, someone, I can't remember who it was, but someone came up with this idea of saying, you know, well, all these people getting blown away in John Woo movies, and, and they're just, they're just, you know, they have no backstory. So it would be funny to put some backstory onto these, you know. So we just started writing these little scripty bits where, you know, I've just won the lottery, and then you get shot, and it's, it, it's a little bit, a little bit black, I suppose. But, but we thought it was hilarious, and, and you know we were allowed to put it in the game. So it's Austin Powers' humour, isn't it? When the goon got killed, in Austin Powers turns out he had a family. Yeah, and... no one ever thinks of the, the family that's of the not, henchmen. Yeah, we've seen that. I think maybe that's where that came from. <laughs> yeah, it's just, again, movies. It was just like, oh, that's great. Yeah, we should do that. We, and I I love... we did some ones where we were saying. They were really funny, but really close to the knuckle, and we ended up saying, "No, we can't, we can't put that in the game." That'll, that'll oh, that's a shame. <laughs> Do you remember any of them? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Answered that a bit too quickly. <laughs> I did love. I love the fact that um, isn't it like that most of the most of the goons, or you had an option to change, make sure that all of the goons were their heads were members of the rare team. And I think that was done for the the XBLA remake, the Forge, as well. Like all the faces are yes, yeah. members of the team. Yeah. Well, um, that was a really nice touch. <laughs> well, it worked for us internally when we were testing it because then we could just uh, shoot each other. Well, I was always gutted that that, that didn't go like I, I remember the um, the face scanning technology you were going to attempt to do in um, with the the Game Boy camera. Yes. And I was always gutted that never because we Chris and I were avid readers of N sixty four magazine. I believe it was a, a reader of that magazine that suggested it, sent it to you guys, and you guys actually started working on it. And I remember seeing the the preview of. 
Andrea Ball, I think, was the uh, editor at the time, and she came to your studio and they showed, like, this is the digitised Andrea Ball, and it looked awful, but it was such a great idea, and I kind of wanted that to be fixed, but it got removed in the end, so I was, I was gutted about that. Yeah, we, we love that, but, um, yeah, it was a little too early for that kind of stuff, in, in particularly with Nintendo games at that point. I think it was... It's, um, it made everything a bit too personal, I suspect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Miyamoto was in it, wasn't he? he he's a yes. With us. And in the remake, uh, the HD remake, it's Molyneux. It's Molyneux, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah no, I, I, I knocked really? out Molyneux last night. So, <laughs> um, I tell you what, I, I, so I was playing last night and I played the um, the, the Data Time mission, the first mission, so, well, were the first three levels, but mm. they were categorised as one mission. And um, two things kind of struck me. One was that... Um, it's kind of amazing that even the Expert LA HD remake, because of the, how primitive the original game was, um, looks like something you could run on a mobile phone nowadays. That's just kind of how far we've come game-wise. But also, it's all the little technical things that I remember reading about and being really impressed with uh, in the original previews. And even now, so things like you could shoot the lights out and the room would go dark. And back in the day, that was incredible. And now that's... Yeah, whatever. You could shoot guns out of, you know, henchmen's heads, uh, hands, sorry, and they would drop their, sorry, out of their heads, I don't know what was that. You could shoot guns out of their hands and they would, like, run off to, to catch it. Like, all these little things that were incredible at the time and now are just commonplace. Like, did you feel like you were breaking new ground when you guys were putting this together? Yeah, I mean, it, again, it was it was a function of the fact that the team worked so well together that people would come up with these ideas and everyone would, would rally around to, to support them if they thought it was doable. And things like shooting the lights out. I mean, there was no lighting in the game at all because you just couldn't do it then. So all the lighting was done on the vertexes by, by artists like me just colouring them. And uh, really, one, you know, one of the key programmers, Mark Edmonds, you know, he loved the detail. He was responsible for the fact that all the weapons were separate up props that could be shot out and, and all that kind of stuff. And I remember we were talking about, you know, how you could do change the lighting conditions by shooting it out. And, and between the two of us working on it, it's like, yeah, well, we can override the color and we can blacken that down and we can set up a little poly that you shoot out, which will be the light, which will register the hit. And we can then over. And so, you know, just having the time and being prepared to, you know, stay late at night and work on these things because they weren't part of the main sort of getting the game done. So it's the extra details like, is this worth doing? Yeah, it is. yes, it is. OK, well, let's do it. And. You know, that was it was just a, a real drive by the team to to make something that was a step above what we'd done previously and hopefully a step above anything else that was out there because we felt like we were working at the pinnacle and we wanted to carry on doing that. And, and the way to do that was to try and, and experiment with things that we thought were cool that people hadn't done before. The same with, you know, the, the sniper rifles and stuff like that, you know. I remember with um, uh, playing GoldenEye, going back to GoldenEye today, it's age. And yes. although I still enjoy it, <laughs> no. it's age. Perfect Dark's age two, but there are elements to that game which I think still stand up today. And there's things like counter op uh, operative that um, just nobody's ever done it since, really. It seems like you were putting things in. I mean, what's it, what's it Tim Stamp said to you? Said to you that rare. He's like. Uh, Tim Stamper told us that, that his goal was for Rare to bring products that wouldn't be on the market for six to eight years and make them available as soon as possible. And that definitely sounds like it's in keeping with, like you said, like trying to be at the pinnacle. And, um, and I think I, I think it comes to I mean, Perfect Dark I always kind of hold up as the game that was massively ahead of his time. Like like you said, Chris, like the, uh, the counter-op mode, such a genius idea, and no one's done it since. And I don't get why. It wasn't very... It had its problems. It had its problems, yes, particularly if you were a guard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Rare was a good place to make games um, when I was there, big, and I assume it still is, but, you know, although there was pressure to get games done, there wasn't the sort of intense pressure that there often has been since, so that, yeah, they wanted the game out by a certain date, and they told you what when they wanted it, and, and you, you tried to hit it, but actually the fundamental thing was always the quality side of it, and if you could go to the stampers and say, actually, you know, we think this is really good and we really want to do this, then they would always talk to Nintendo, you know, and they had a great, very, very close working relationship with Nintendo and they would talk to Nintendo and, and they would usually, and they would give us that time to do those sorts of things so that, that there was that time to 
focus on the little bits and the quality of it. And also just the iteration, you know, it's said it before, you know, one of the reasons why GoldenEye was good was it had so much testing and had so much time being tested. There was time for us to get the feedback, both from the testing we did in, at Rare and also from the Mario Club, Mario Club and, and just reiterate and, and play it again and again and, and change it and, and do it again. You know, that, that testing time and that ability to play and pre replay and replay you know that helps you develop these sort that sort of gameplay in, in those days, particularly. You know, so the time, you know, the, the time time is a luxury, and and, and Rare were good at providing that. Who was the mad purse that dreamt up those weapons? Because that that's one of the best things about. They are game. incredible. That is one of the best games Arsenal's going. <laughs> I genuinely can't. Remember. I suspect from what if I'm trying to think back that far now. Um, I, it was pretty much again a team effort, I think, because uh, certainly in terms of the designs, they were done by tended to be done by Lee Ray, the artist. But in terms of what they did, I mean, everyone had their opinion based on the fact that we played so much deathmatch of what sorts of weapons would be fun. Um, and you know, again, it was very open in that we didn't have a, a, a de facto designer who was in charge of it. We, it was everyone's input into I would like a weapon that does this. And I remember we did put an awful lot of different try, try out a lot of different things, and some of them worked and some of them didn't. Again, it was that ability to try stuff out and play with it for a while and play deathmatch in the evenings and say, yeah, this gun just doesn't work or this gun's awesome, but it'd be better if we did this with it. So, What I kind of loved was like all of the guns were so unique, largely because of the, the whole secondary fire thing. Like nowadays, nowadays like, like, certainly the more realistic shooters and stuff, like you know, you've got, they'll have you know, hundreds of weapons, but they'll all be the same. Pistols, submachine guns, shotguns, assault rifles. But this one, like you've got like an assault rifle that if you throw it away, it becomes a grenade, or the upped version. Yeah, you know, that was the dragon, and then the super dragon was a assault rifle come grenade launcher, and then you had like the K7, which detected like auto guns, and then you had like a, a, like the far sight, which obviously you know could see through walls and then would track down targets. The cyclone, which would like, unload an entire bloody clip. Like there was Slayer. the Slayer. Yes, the remote control rockets. Like, I do I remember just, the far side. I remember. I remember. I think it was. I can't remember. Might have been uh, Martin Hollis who came up with the far sight and said, "What if we could see through the walls with a gun?" And we're thinking, "Oh my God, how are we going to do that?" Because of the cost of of making walls transparent. But you know, again, it went off and did it, and just everyone loved it as soon as it was like, "Yeah, this is fabulous." That's amazing. What was what was your favourite gun out of the lot then? Probably the far side, I think, because I, when, I remember when it was first decided, and it's like, uh, you know, we can't do this, can we? I, I think it, it also came from the fact, that, you know, we loved in Goldeneye, the, you know, with the doors with the little windows in where guards would walk past, and you had the magnum which could shoot through the door, mm. and we just thought that was so much fun. So we thought we'd take it to the next step. Well, what if you don't need a window? You can just see through anywhere and have a gun that you can shoot through uh, to the other side. And that was just because it's all those classic, you know, sort of movie things where people hide behind something, but then the thing they're hiding behind isn't actually good enough. You know, <laughs> that's. Because so many movies had that thing where you can hide behind a piece of foil and it's fine. So we were doing the opposite, saying, "Ah, no, you know, you may think you're safe behind a wall, but you're not." The one game I came to, the, sorry, the one gun I came to love and hate, mostly hate, was the laptop gun, simply wow. because in deathmatch. So I, we used to, I used to have a bunch of friends. We used to all come around like each other's house and play GoldenEye um, four player, and um, just throughout the summer holidays. And then when obviously Perfect Dark came out, we went up to that. And a friend of mine, the you know, the the guy that plays odd job, we all have that friend who always plays his odd job. He would play Perfect Dark as Elvis's body with a human head, so he's even smaller than odd job, and he would hide in a room with a laptop gun attached <coughs> to the wall, and he would just mow us down. He'd win all the matches for no other reason than he was just hiding and cowardly. So whoever came up with that I think that I've was got... Duncan Botwood, the designer. Right. Pretty sure. I remember he, he he sketched it up and brought it in and looked at it and said, that's just an awesome idea. If we track him down for a future episode, I need to have words. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's brilliant. Laptop comes was my favourite. Um, so, I mean, was there anything... I mean, you introduced Goldeneye elements in per, the Perfect Dark, particularly the multiplayer with those levels and some of the weapons. Was there anything that you wanted to bring in from the previous game into the new one? Um, in terms of what gameplay you mean? or Any elements, really. Any elements. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think... I think we were just really interested in the story side of it because, we, you know, Goldeneye was telling a story that had already been set out for us. So, so we just wanted to tell our own story. Um, and that was the big thing that was driving us on it. And everything else, it was just a case of 
trying to do it better than we'd done it before. You know, so making sure the death match was better, making sure the actual single player was better, getting more of a more sort of carrying on with that narrative of, of traveling around the world and doing stuff which Bond does, but doing it with these new characters. Um, so you know, I, I think it was in that sense it was it was the it was the chance to be creative with the story. That was the thing that really interested us. We wanted, you know, and when we left set up Free Radical, the first project that we were supposed to be doing. Uh, was the one that ended up being uh, Second Sight, which was, again, very heavily narrative. We, you know, we mm. really wanted to tell a story. So, you know, that was our goal as a team, I think. I do remember being that. I, I was one of those guys that used that cinema function in the game to watch all the cutscenes as a kind of a little half an hour movie. Because, um, like, I mean, like you, you, we've already discussed, like, kind of the movie inspiration. It, did, it certainly did feel like um, it was set up as a kind of a movie-esque experience and definitely had, like, a proper... Decent. I, th- I think it was one of the first games I played with like a proper full voice cast and cutscenes and a uh, full storyline. Maybe because I just didn't have, didn't play as many non N sixty four games back then. Um, although I, I do have to question whoever attempted the uh, Scottish accent as Daniel Carrington. <laughs> and so even, even last night when I was playing, it was like, oh, that that's a bit weird. Yeah. <laughs> we were all very frustrated filmmakers and directors, and, and I remember discussing whether we were talking to them about whether we could actually get professional actors in to do the to voice because it was you know it was the very early days of voice acting in video games and, and then we, they're all being done in-house we were going around rare trying to find people who could talk into a microphone and sound reasonably good and and you know credit to the people who did it but you know none of them were actors so we just couldn't afford you know it wasn't ever built into a budget to have voice actors and not, not you know real quality ones that, that do cost a decent chunk of money so it was it was a bit amateurish in that sense but um you know most things are when they start out. I, you know, I find it really fascinating that you said Second Son was going to be your next project. Because I played Second Son and I thought to myself, that game is very much like Perfect Dark. It felt like Perfect Dark, the story did. So I actually found that quite a fascinating bit of insight there. Mm. That's what we left to make initially, but we ended up getting distracted by, by the time splitters. But, you know... Um... Second sight was the thing we initially left to make. Yeah, well, I was definitely like reminded of time splitters last night. Like I said, I like, played um, the data dine missions, and back in the day, I just played it on Agent. I only played the game on Agent because I I know Chris is shaking his head at me, which doesn't come across <laughs> on audio. But um, I, the trouble was, I'm not very good at games. Gold and I are played entirely through on Agent. And I got through, and I still had to tr- trouble with the later level. So Perfect Dark, I just played through on Asian. I think I might have started some of Secret Asian. But then last night I thought, you know what? I've got you know 10 plus years um, gaming experience since this first game came out. I'm going to give it a go on Secret Asian. And I didn't have a clue what I was doing because there was because you really do. And, and you know the, the reason I mentioned Time Splitters is it's kind of very similar to the Time Splitters game in that if you play on the easiest difficulty, you're really only getting a demo of the game. I remember, like, Time Slitters 2, the, the first level, I think if you the, the dam level, if you play it on easy, you just go through some buildings, go under the dam, come into a tunnel, that's the game over. And if you play it on the medium or hard difficulty, you go up the top of the dam, you fight a helicopter. It's like, and I found that um, with Perfect Dark last night, I played the, the second mission into the Data Dine Laboratories, and there was this whole, you need to go and find the scientists and shut down the experiments. And I suddenly thought, I don't know where they are. I don't know how to do that. And I got, what's it? I got to the um, the the laser grid where you have to wait for the little cleaning robots to go through and deactivate the lasers. I'm standing there for bloody ages, thinking, where the hell is this robot? And then I noticed on the, the objectives menu, oh no, I have to go back and reprogram them. Right, where the hell are they? It was just, it was amazing that it was um, it was a completely different game, depending on what difficulty you played on. Yeah, I mean, I, we had that with most of the games we made actually. That, I mean, particularly. I mean, we were all in those days quite hardcore gamers, but particularly people like Mark Edmonds and, and Dave Doak were really hardcore gamers, and, and they were determined to to get every nuance out of gameplay in there and to make it really hard. And I remember early on in Perfect Dark doing the first level, an incredibly long level with all these different things, and, and Simon Farmer, the Rare's production manager, came over. He played a test build and said, "You know, are you guys nuts? You know, this is far, far <laughs> too hard." You know, and so we would always start off with the hardest level we could make. And then we would cut it back to make it easier until we got to a point where we thought, okay, you don't have to be too, too much of a gamer to be able to get through this and enjoy it. Um, and that, I think that's a nice way to do it backwards, rather than for, you know, rather than making a level, then trying to make it harder by making everything smarter and faster. It's actually start with the hard, start making it really rock hard, and then take out the elements that are making it hard, too hard, and, and, and make an easier version. That's how we tended to do it. Playing it now really does make me appreciate regenerative health. 
Um, I, I remember when it when it came out on 360 when they did they did the HD remake. I remember getting to the um, the final level, the Skedar ruins, and fighting the Skedar boss, and I couldn't even get to the boss. I kept dying. And this is and again this is on Asian because you've just games have made us so reckless nowadays because you just have to hide behind a conveniently placed chest high wall and your health comes back to you. Whereas when you go back and play Perfect Dark, it's like no, actually you really really do need to think, particularly if there isn't a shield. Because there's no way to, to recover health. It's a lot tougher, a lot more tactical than I remember it being. The most stressful thing in the game was looking at your health bar, you know. Yes. Because <laughs> there was nothing you could do about it. And you forget that now with the way games work. But, you know, that time that was the thing that made you sit on the edge of your seat. Like, I've only got this much health left and I've got to get this much further through the level. Am I going to do it? You know, and yeah. There's a Doom that comes out next year. It doesn't have regenerative health. Ah. You have to pick up health points. So oh, I'm looking forward to that. We're going back to that. Excellent, excellent. I mean, well, I mean, on that note, I mean, do you do you play um, any kind of shooters now and, and think, ah, that reminds me of Perfect Dark, or well, that's kind of clearly inspired by Perfect Dark, or any of the games you kind of worked on? Uh, I don't play so much first-person shooters anymore, um, mainly because yeah, like you said, they've, they, I, found, I found they've become so. I miss the old four-player deathmatch, which is what I really enjoy playing, and you don't get that mm-hmm. so much anymore. I don't really enjoy the online uh, multiplayer so much, so I, I tend to stay away from those. Um, it's always nice when you see first-person shooters and you see things in there, you think, yeah, that's something that we sort of were involved in helping to... Because it's a whole genre that, that started after that console shooter, so you know, you're know, you not saying that you're taking credit for it, but it's nice to see that the things that you were involved in thinking about early on are still there now, so that's always nice. I mean, I... I, I I'm a car nut, so I still play lots of driving games. So that's what I, do. <laughs> I I miss playing games like Perfect Dark, where you can have a much bigger arsenal on you at any point. Because nowadays, like, and then this is largely oh, since Halo back. first came out, where the Halo you limited you to two weapons, and nowadays it's always like two, three, or four weapons. You can't really help. But I remember like looking at the the weapon wheel and thinking, well, fantastic. I've got a couple of pistols here. I've got some submachine guns. I've got a rocket launcher. I've got a sniper rifle. And that, like, just depending on the level, you could end up with so many tools. And nowadays, you just you really have to you have to choose your way. It stressed me out like Borderlands, which has got so many wacky guns, and you have to limit yourself to four. And that's only at the end of the game when you've unlocked all the weapon slots. We're sounding very old. Yes, we yeah. are. Yeah, we are. <laughs> you remember the good old days? In my day. Yeah. I mean, it's true that the games have become so, you know, focused on on trying to control things like that. And, and actually, back when those games, early games, were made, you know, we didn't really care uh, because no one had overanalyzed it. I suppose at that point, so it's like, yeah, you have many weapons as you want. Yeah, just pick them up. Yeah, because we were just to joke about the size of the backpack you must be carrying around with you. To, but no one no, never occurred to us to limit it because that would be less fun. And and but at the end of the day, you know. The, I think one of the things I don't like about a lot of the first versions these days is they're just not that much fun. They mm. tend to be rather dull, tend to be rather serious, you know, self aggrandizing very, very intense storylines and, and, you know, killing people. And, and it's all very intense and it's like and often very grey and, and overcast and rainy or whatever. And it's just like, what happened to the fun part of, you know, shooting someone? <laughs> so, not, not enough monkeys. Not enough monkeys, precisely. Yeah, yeah. definitely not enough monkeys. I, you know, for me, games are always about having fun and, and nothing should come between that. And if you get too down the line, you know, serious storytelling, then, then you start to lose sight of why you're playing the game, which maybe, you know, some people obviously just play for the, the story and the, and the, the theatre and the stress and everything, but I, I want to have a bit of fun as well. On the note of fun, one thing that for me Perfect Dark really epitomises about Rare is the team's ability to predict how gamers will muck around and then reward them for that. So specifically, I, I think of two things. When you're at the top of the um, the data dine centre at the very, very start of the game and there's flying cars around, you can shoot them down and they explode. <laughs> the only reason for that is that you knew we would shoot them to try and see if they explode. And then, And I still did it last night in the Carrington Villa um, when you're in the basement, shoot the bottles, shooting all the bottles, and I still did it last night, just to see. And you just hear Daniel in his awful Scottish accent, "At your age, Joanna," and you got an achievement for it. And you got an achievement, yeah, exactly. It's like, yes, you're wonderful. You're rewarding me for being a prat. Thank you. Yeah, it's, I mean, to be fair, I think some of that was influenced by Metal Gear Solid because there was the very first one. There was the brilliant bit in the storeroom where there was a load of. Uh, uh, loads of stuff on shelves you could shoot and you could hide inside a cardboard box as well which we just thought was hilarious <laughs> and so it's like well we need to have more of this sort of stuff so in that point and again 
the coders particularly, you know, were very keen on this sort of, well, if it's in the background, it should be interactive because we hated environments where there was all this detail, but actually it was all just solid and nothing happened to it. So that's why, partly why we wanted to be able to shoot lights out. And that's also why, you know, if there were, if there were things on shelves, you should be able to shoot them. And if there's cars flying by, you should be able to shoot them. And, you know, and again, it's that thing that, you know, a programmer would sit behind, stay late one evening and just get that working. And, you know, an artist would get it working and, and do the special effects for it. And, you know, the joy that you got from those little things <laughs> you know, it was just, it was it was just the great details. Fun. Yeah, and, and we knew, you know, we knew people would discover that. We knew gamers, we all thought the same way. We knew people would shoot them down, and we knew the delight. And we always called it surprise and delight features. It's like when you, I always likened it to when you buy a car, you know, and you discover some nice little feature that it does that you didn't know. And it's just, it's the thing that makes you think, that's a great game. Even if parts of the game frustrate you later, you'll still think, no, that, that game made me smile. I'm definitely going to be uh, pouring through the uh, the Rare Replay edition to try and find uh, more surprise and delights that I missed first time round. Um, before uh, before we wrap up, is there any stories that you remember working on Perfect Dark that might enlighten or entertain some of our listeners? Anything that listeners don't know that they probably shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I don't know. Um, I mean, we, the, I don't know if I've said it before, but uh, I mean, we played an awful lot of multiplayer games while we were making those games. Um, we did it on GoldenEye and we carried on doing it on Perfect Dark and I remember particularly Dave and uh, Mark Edmonds and Duncan Botwood were very, very competitive and we would play uh, multiplayer games at lunchtime and, and I certainly remember people storming out of the building having been particularly thrashed at something and refusing to come back until until they were apologised to, you know. <laughs> I remember car- a cartridge being ripped out of an end, uh, 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 top of a, I think it was a SNES, I think it was Bomberman and being thrown out the window and st- storming off, you know, uh, because people would start to gang up on each other then. It was, it was uh, a very, very sort of competitive and uh, but good-natured um, environment to do that on. So it was great fun. I remember sitting around arguing about the name of Joanna Dark a lot uh, and we had a big door full of names stuck up and, and people would put, every time they had a net, an idea for a name they would type it out, print it out as big as possible and stick it on this door and then every, and everyone had a right of veto so if you walked past the door and you, t- you saw a new name there and you didn't like it you were allowed to take it down uh, and there was some huge, you know, so, but that was a brilliant name. No, it was a terrible name. We can't possibly use that. It's like, so yeah, that was a very long drawn out um, democratic, non-democratic process. So what, what were some of the names that they got? Right? I mean, could, could she have been Mildred Dark at some point or something? <laughs> I have, I, can't, I know, I mean, that's been said before, but I mean, the name came from, from Joan of Arc. That's where, that's where it came from in the end. Oh, I didn't um, actually know that. Did you not? <laughs> I'm learning. Yay. <laughs> So we decided the game, the same with the game's name, we were trying to come up with the right name for it and, and we sort of got down to several different versions all around being perfect and being dark and we, and we decided perfect dark was, was the one for us. And having chosen that, we then were trying to do a play on words so we decided that she would be called dark but we weren't sure what to call the first name so she was going to be something dark. Uh, and I was reading some history stuff and it was about Joan of Arc and in French it's Jean de Arc. So I said, well, why don't we call her Jean? And then it got changed to, I think Dave said it, it, should, it should be Joanna. And, and so it became Joanna Dark. Nice. So that's there, we that. there we go. Excellent. A bit of history lesson. I'm going to be wielding <laughs> that fact like no one knows. <laughs> Excellent. Um, thank you so much for your time, Carl. Um, that's been absolutely wonderful. Um, I mean, if there's anything you want to kind of plug at all or any kind of last message you'd like to leave us, that, uh, that'd be great. Oh, it's been great. It's been a lot of fun. It makes me want to go and grab the cartridge. I've got one upstairs in my attic somewhere. I need to go and grab it. And- do it. Dust it off. Do it. Yeah. It's still wonderful. It's hugely excited and then slightly disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you need to make sure you've got the memory pack. Oh, yeah, the expansion pack, because otherwise you only got like half the game. Oh, of course. Yes, yes. That's, so. yeah. that, that definitely wasn't my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, thank you very much, Carl. Thank you so much for your time. No problem. It was great fun. Next time on Rare Replayed, we are going to be talking to, uh, which I'm going to tell you we can talk to, it's very exciting, but we're going to be, to- we're going to be talking about the game Banjo-Kazooie. 
You can find out more about the show and all of our episodes at www.rareplayed.com.